in the summer of 64, not 1964, but 64, for nine days, a huge fire raged in the city of Rome. It was well known that the Emperor Nero desired to refurbish Rome by whatever means possible. And so when Roman troops prevented others from extinguishing the fire, and when they even set fires in themselves, it became quite evident to the populace that Nero was behind it all, that Nero had in fact started these fires, or at least it was through his command that these fires had been started. And so because the populace had become clued in on this, the Roman historian Tacitus tells us that Nero provided for himself a scapegoat, Christians. He blamed the Christians for starting the fire in Rome. And so began an increasingly intense time of persecution for believers by both the government and the general populace. Nero later even used Christians as torches to light his gardens at night. I'm going to read you a short quote here from the Roman historian Tacitus that tells us just that. Tacitus writes, Covered with the skins of beasts, they, that is Christians, they were torn by dogs and perished, or were nailed to crosses, or were doomed to the flames and burnt, to serve as a nightly illumination when daylight had expired. Nero, Nero offered his gardens for the spectacle. It's pretty terrifying, isn't it? Our text this morning begins with these words, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. While these words, fiery trial, I think they do serve as a figure of speech uh, for a much broader range of sufferings. It, it does help us to know the historical context, doesn't it? it, it uh, we could say illuminates the meaning. This is the context of the Christians that Peter is writing to. We fast forward 2,000 years. Even today, thousands upon thousands of Christians around the globe are killed for their faith every year. Uh, just, uh, just the other day, I read an article from the Christian Post this year. So really just from January to July, 6,000 Christians in Nigeria are slaughtered. Here's, here's the uh, title of the article. Pure genocide. Over 6,000 Nigerian Christians slaughtered, mostly women and children. So that's just in one part of the world over half a year's time. It's heart-wrenching, isn't it? It's heart-wrenching to think about not only the persecution that Christians went through in the first century, but even Christians today around the world. And of course, there's more than just that. Um, while some may not face death, uh, they face physical assault, imprisonment, all kinds of intense persecutions. So in our, in our country, we have it much easier, don't we? I, I hesitate to even make any comparisons, but at least the potential for persecution is on the rise. And I think that if, if you watch the news, you, you can see that, that at least the potential for persecution is on the rise. And, and it depends on how we define persecution. Of course, on a smaller scale, there, there's persecution all over the place, even in the United States. And then besides persecution, there are many other sufferings that a Christian might face. For example, our devotion to Christ it can disrupt relationships with those who are not devoted to Christ. And that hurts. It hurts whenever a relationship is disrupted because of one's devotion to Christ. And make no, make no mistake, there will be some people who will want nothing to do with you because of your Christian values, priorities, and so on. Then there are all kinds of comforts. One might be called a sacrifice for the sake of the gospel. And finally, there's just simply the reality of living in a fallen world. Cancer, depression, tragedies of all kinds. These kinds of things no one is immune from. Even here, we can face many, many kinds of, of suffering. So what is the purpose of it all, and how are we to respond to it? These are the questions that we're going to ask this morning. Uh, but first, we're going to read the text. And so if you would stand with me, we're going to read... 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning in verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised 
at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let no one suffer as a murderer or as a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glory, let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is, if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Let's pray. God, as we, as we think about suffering this morning, suffering of those around the world and even our own suffering, or maybe our lack of suffering, and, and, and as, as we think about how we ought to be ready for suffering, how, how we are to respond to suffering when it does come to our way, Lord, help us. Help us to understand what your word has to teach us on this. Help us to respond to it accordingly by your Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you haven't opened your Bibles yet, uh, I, I would encourage you to open with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. Two headings in the sermon. The first is the purpose of Christian suffering, and then the proper response to Christian suffering. So first, the purpose of Christian suffering. Now, before we get into this, understand that our focus this morning is limited. Uh, we're not addressing why God has allowed suffering to come into the world. That's a really profound question that, that's worth tackling. In fact, it would take a whole sermon that, and probably a lot more than that to tackle that question. So we're not, we're, not just, we're not asking why God has allowed suffering to come into the world. We're asking how God has determined to use suffering in the life of a Christian. That is, what is its purpose? What is the purpose of suffering or of Christian suffering? And we're told, we're actually told in this first verse, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. Right? That's, that's the purpose, to test you. And so we're told what the purpose is right there. It is to test us. Now, before we talk about what this means, let's talk about what it doesn't mean, okay? Um, this is not the only place in the Bible that talks about Christians being tested. And understand, um, when the Bible talks about Christians being tested, it's not as if God is up in heaven saying, oh, okay, I, want, I wonder how Bob's going to respond to this, and what about this? You know, he, he's not up there scheming in heaven. It's not some kind of divine experiment. It's not something that God takes pleasure in. But it is something that God sees as necessary for our assurance and sanctification. God sees suffering as necessary for our assurance and for our sanctification. Again, sanctification, we talk about often, is, is the um, being made holy, being made like Christ. Another way to put it would be our proven faith, our purified faith. We talked about that in the sermon. In fact, I want to turn to 1 Peter chapter 1 because we see that um, Peter has already talked about the testing of our faith, and he's, he's compared it to the testing of gold, that is the refining of gold. So 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7. In this you rejoice, talking about your salvation, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so there we see that this testing is compared to the, the testing of gold, to the refining of gold. 
And in that, uh, uh, when I preached on that passage weeks ago, the title of that was Proven, Purified, and Persevering Faith. Proven, purified, and persevering faith. And we see that in, in these two verses in particular, that our faith is proven and purified through suffering. So that would correspond with the assurance and the sanctification that I spoke of a moment ago. Right? Just as gold is proven and purified through fire, so our faith is proven and purified through trials. Or we could say that suffering is a means for both assurance and sanctification. Again, those words go hand in hand with one another. So here's how it works, okay? When we persevere, when we persevere in faith and repentance through suffering, it yields assurance. That is assurance of our salvation, assurance that we really are believers, assurance that we really are saved, right? It yields assurance and sanctification in our lives. So it confirms our faith. It even confirms God's faithfulness to us, right? When we go through trials as a Christian, it confirms our faith as we trust in God, through that trial, it confirms God's faithfulness to us. So there's the assurance. And it also, it grows us in Christ likeness. It grows us in sanctification. And so that's really huge, isn't it? Um, we, we, we can't miss God's purpose for us in suffering. So accordingly, these, these uh, spiritual fruits of suffering, they should be a priority in our prayers. And I think this is something that... Uh, that Christians, especially all over the United States today, I, I, think, I think we really, really need to, to get this. Our prayers should not be solely focused upon the alleviation of pain and greater comfort. I, I fear that, that, that often that is, that is exactly what our prayers become. And oh, how weak and unbiblical that is for us just to simply pray for the alleviation of pain and for, for greater comfort. Right? We, that's, that's, that's just the norm today, but I, I don't think we see that in the scriptures, and I think for good reason. And then let me say, I can, I can be guilty of this as well, right? It's easy just to simply pray for, you know, wh whether it's someone who's sick or someone who's going through some kind of trial, or whether maybe it's even myself, just to simply pray, okay, God, I want you to make this pain go away. But what we're seeing in this passage is that God has brought it into our lives for a reason. So we, can't, we don't want to waste that suffering. We don't, want, we don't want to just say, okay, God, get it out of my life. But we want to say, okay, God, I know that you brought this into my life for a reason. And so we want to pray for that, right? So, so let, me, let me just um, confess to you how I think I have maybe been unfaithful in this. Um, Silas, our youngest one, when we, when we ask him to pray for dinner, um, <laughs> he says the same prayer every time. Like, so we're praying for a meal, but he, he doesn't ever pray for the food. He, he, said, he says, God, help us not be sick. Help us not be sick. That's what he says. Now, where did he pick that up? Well, you know, we, we pray every night when we have family worship. And uh, we might, you know, if there's a sickness going through the family, if we're praying for someone else, you know, we, we might just simply offer up a prayer. God, we pray that you will um, bring healing, help so-and-so not to be sick, that kind of thing. And that's not a bad thing to pray for. Don't, don't, don't mishear me. That's a good thing to pray for, right? We, we, we can bring these requests before God. God wants us to bring our requests before him. But... Um, that, that, shouldn't, that shouldn't be where it stops. It shouldn't even be where it begins. Rather, I think our prayer should sound something like this, right? So, so if we have some kind of trial that's come into our life, say, God, help me to pass this test. Help, help me to, to prove faithful. And God, I pray that, that you will show your faithfulness to me and that you will grow me in, in Christ's likeness through this trial. I know you brought this into my life for a reason. You're sovereign over everything. And so God, use this for the purpose in which you intended. And then we can pray for healing, for alleviation, for restoration, if that be the Lord's will. We can pray with great passion. I, I, I've often, I've often um, refers to Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus prays, let this cup pass from me. He prays with great passion, right? He, 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 he wants to be relieved of the suffering. And so we, we, we can pray that. We can pray, God, let this cup pass from me. But then he says, not my will, but yours. And we have to understand that God's will is our sanctification. 
as we talked about last week. God wants to use suffering for our sanctification. He wants to use it for all kinds of purposes. We see at the very end of this passage, what does it say? If I can turn back to it, it says, Therefore let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. So we recognize that, that God has a purpose for our suffering. And so we, we, want, we, want, to, we want to lean into that. And we want, to, we want to pray according to that. And so that's, that's a message to me as well. We see in this passage though, that the suffering is ultimately for our good. And God works all things for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. This does not mean that we should seek it out. We don't have to seek suffering. We don't have to seek to be persecuted for our faith or anything like that. But it does mean that when suffering does come our way, that we should embrace it. Even that we should rejoice in it. That's exactly what Peter says in this passage. That we should rejoice in it. And this, this is a hard thing to preach. I don't like suffering. I hate suffering. Anybody with me? You hate suffering? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't like it. But we must trust that Jesus is better than all the comforts of this world. And so we must love Jesus more than we hate suffering. Do you love Jesus more than you hate suffering? We must love Jesus more than we hate suffering, so much so that we, in fact, embrace suffering when it comes our way. Because we know that through it, we can find a greater rest in Jesus. We can become more like him. We don't want to miss that. Now, in verses 17 through 18, so we'll skip forward a little bit here. Peter indicates that this testing of believers is also a form of a judgment. But it is a unique kind of judgment. Though severe, it is not punitive. It is not punishment. It's important for us to understand that. Romans 8.1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus took on the punishment of our sins. And yet, in this passage, Peter uses the word judgment in reference to Christians. So I want to, I want to make clear it's a unique kind of judgment. It's not a punitive judgment. It's not punishment. However, it is it's purifying. Right? It is purifying, but not punitive. It does, however, anticipate a final punitive judgment of unbelievers. Let's go ahead and look at this of these two verses, 17 through 18. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel? You see that our purifying judgment is anticipating the punitive judgment of those who do not believe? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So it's as if our purifying judgment, that is the purifying judgment, the sanctifying judgment of believers is, is like the birth pains of the punitive judgment that's to come upon unbelievers, right? If we must go through this, if the righteous is scarcely saved, then what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Let me read to you a quote from John MacArthur in his commentary on this. He says, it is infinitely better for people to endure suffering with joy now as believers, being purified for effective testimony to eternal glory, than to later bear eternal torment as unbelievers. He continues in his commentary, noting that this word that's translated scarcely, you see that in verse 18, this word translated scarcely, it reveals the difficulty with which believers are brought to final salvation through the fires of unjust suffering, divine purging, and God-ordained discipline. All right, so these are the fiery trials that we go through. And it's, and it's part of our salvation. That is when we think of our salvation at, in, in the big picture. Um, I have been saved. I am being saved. I will be saved. Right? We often talk about our salvation is just simply our justification. And we can do that. We can say I was saved at this point in my life. But, but remember, the, the bigger picture of salvation in the Bible is that it's, uh, yes, we're justified, and now we're being sanctified, and soon we'll be glorified. And so, and so, so God is, is, is working in us even now towards that final stage of our salvation, our glorification. And so it involves trials. So, so, so there we see the purpose of Christian suffering. 
Now let's turn to the proper response. And so we're going to go back to verse 12 and, and then work our way through the proper response to Christian suffering. How are we to respond to this when things come our way? Well, first, do not be surprised. Right? Verse 12, beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Don't think it's strange. Don't be surprised. <clears throat> this, is, this is especially easy for us to fall into, this snare of, of, of being taken by surprise. I think it's especially easy for us because of our time and place in history. We just, cel we just celebrated Independence Day. And uh, what, what a great occasion to celebrate, isn't it? Um, we, we have been given so much through the sacrifice of others and ultimately by the providence of God. So it's a great occasion to celebrate, but it should also be sobering. Yes, as we think about the sacrifices that were made for our freedom, but it's, it's also sobering as we think in particular about our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world today and throughout history. Because what we have to understand is that freedom and prosperity, ease and plenty is not the norm, right? Big picture, it is not the norm. That's why you know, he, he's telling them, don't be surprised. And, and the context in which he is speaking to them, they, they are coming under increasing persecution. And, and throughout history, throughout the world, that has been the norm for Christians. Not freedom and prosperity, ease and plenty, but the persecution and all kinds of suffering. And so that's not the norm, except in our experience, by and large, it is. And so that puts us at, at a greater risk, I think. We have many comforts and, and, and much less suffering. So we, we especially might be surprised when suffering finally comes our way in one form or another. And understand, if you're caught by surprise, that, that can break a person, right? If, if, you, if you are, rather than leaning upon God and trusting in Him, if you begin to trust in your own um, wealth and, 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 and your own prosperity and, and all these things, when suffering comes your way, it can break you. So we must be aware of being caught off guard. Indeed, our expectation should be suffering. Right? We need to wire our brains in such a way that say, okay, even, even, though, even though I live in, in, this, in this great land, in this great time and place in history where I don't, I don't experience on a regular basis the same kind of suffering that Christians throughout history have, even so, my expectation should be, I need to be ready for suffering to come my way. And then we, we, uh, we think of everything else as, as undeserved blessings. Blessings for which we should be very, very thankful. And of which we must be good stewards, lest they become an idol. Because like all good things, they can become an idol. In fact, you know, that's, that's basically what sin is, right? It's, it's, the, it's the twisting of, good, of, of God's good gifts. Twisting it into something that is perverted, or even just simply making that good gift itself an idol. And so we, we, have, we have to be aware of that. And we have to be ready for suffering to come our way. We have to have that as an expectation. And when it does come our way, we embrace it. All right, so that first... First point is we, we must not be surprised. Second, second response to Christian suffering is that we rejoice. Verse 13. <clears throat> but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Would you flip over with me to James? Just a, just a few pages backwards. James 1, verses 2 through 4. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That's very similar to our passage, especially 
if we look uh, at First Peter as a whole, we see these same themes, right? And we see here in James, the same reason is given that we discussed in our first point, that is the purpose of Christian suffering. So, so, so we recognize that suffering produces in us steadfastness, it strengthens our faith, it confirms our faith, it gives us assurance, it, it, it sanctifies us, makes us more like Jesus, all those things. So that's one reason we should rejoice when suffering comes our way. But another reason is simply the honor of sharing in Christ's sufferings. And this is, this is especially true whenever you're suffering for your faith, perhaps suffering persecution. I think it's especially true, but I think, I think there's even a broader application here that, that in the sufferings of the, Christ, of the Christian's life, that we are, we are sharing in Christ's sufferings. Maybe another specific application besides persecution is whenever you make some kind of sacrifice for the sake of the gospel, right? And, uh, and, and we all should be making sacrifices for the sake of the gospel. You're sharing in Christ's sufferings. Now there is a lesson to be learned here, and that is that when we take on the name Christian, our identification with Christ is a package deal. That is, we identify with both his death and his resurrection both his suffering and his glory. We can't, we can't choose the latter and push away the former. Look at, look at the verse again. It says, Rejoice in so far as you share in Christ's suffering, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Right. So if you want to rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed, you, you need to rejoice and be glad in your sufferings and, and your participation in Christ's suffering. So, it's a package deal, right? Death and resurrection. I mean, we baptize someone. You're buried with Christ in baptism. You're raised to walk in newness of life. You're dying to your sin, uh, but you're also, that, that also means you're taking up your cross. You're following Jesus, and it's going to involve all kinds of suffering. But there's a resurrection coming. So, we rejoice. Third, a third response proper response to christian suffering consider yourself blessed aren't these things like like just so so counterintuitive rejoice consider yourself blessed but look look at verse 14 if you were insulted for the name of christ you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of god rests upon you so i, I spoke earlier about the many blessings that we have living in this time and place in history. And these are something worth celebrating, giving thanks for. Right? Every good and perfect gift is from above. So we give thanks to God for all of these blessings. But do you understand that, do you realize the New Testament uses the word blessing in a much different way? I think it's very interesting. The way that we typically, when we talk about blessings, we want to talk about friends and family and freedom, financial security. These are all blessings from God. Well, yes, they are. But, but this, the, the New Testament doesn't tend to use the word blessing in that way. The, the New Testament uses the word blessing in a much different way. Think about the Beatitudes, right? Uh, Jesus, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the meek. He goes, let me just read you the last part of this, because this, this last part is, is especially stinging. Blessed, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For you, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. That's, that's pretty radical, isn't it? That's, that's what it is to be blessed, Jesus says. And then in our text this morning, again, verse 14, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Right. So, so he's, he's saying that you know, there, there's something good that comes of it. Right. It's not necessarily that, that the suffering itself is a blessing, but, it, but it's, 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 it's the reason the suffering has come upon you, right? In the, in the case of persecution, hey, that, that means you're living for Jesus. 
but also what, what, what's, what's ahead, right? Um, again, Jesus says that your reward in heaven is great. Or here it says because the, the glory, the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. And so, so there are certain things that come through suffering that, that are true blessings of God in, in an even greater sense than, than all the maybe material things that we often think of. So it's, it's quite a different perspective. So blessed are you when you're insulted for the name of Christ. Now being insulted for the name of Christ is um, probably a persecution we can all better relate to. Um, right? We, thankfully we haven't had to endure imprisonment or, or beatings, although God could use that in a wonderful way in our lives. Um, but uh, but I, don't, I don't think any of us have have experienced that kind of persecution, but you could probably relate to being insulted for the name of Christ. But if, if you've yet to be insulted for your faith, let me go ahead and get you taken care of. You prudish, judgmental, narrow-minded, holier-than-thou, Bible-thumping bigot. How'd that feel? All right, so if, if you haven't been insulted for your faith, there it is, okay? Now, <laughs> if someone ever does fire these things off at you, um, it's always good to do a little bit of self-examination because they could, they could be spot on, right? Um, right? We, we, we can often present ourselves, our faith in the wrong way. But know that there are some who will never, who, you'll never be able to please them without compromising. And we must not compromise. And so consider yourself blessed when they insult you. Consider yourself blessed. Indeed, when any kind of suffering comes your way, consider yourself blessed. And so maybe you could use, uh, for those of you who use social media, right? Uh, that would be something, a good occasion to use the hashtag blessed, right? Um, I lost my job today, hashtag blessed. Or I got laughed at today because I'm a Christian, hashtag blessed. That would, that would kind of throw people for a loop. And, uh, well, I think we see that Jesus and Peter kind of throw us for a loop here, don't they? And so, um, consider yourself blessed. Fourth and finally, do not be ashamed. Do not be ashamed. So verses 15 and 16. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler, Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Let him glory, let him glorify God in that name. Do not be ashamed. You know, this, uh, this is one of two times the word Christian is used in the Bible. You maybe expect the word Christian to be used a lot more in the Bible, but it's actually a label that took some time to come into use. And understand, it was, it was not meant to be flattering. It was uh, probably a, a pejorative. It was, it, was, it was something that was... Um, used in a negative way towards believers. But Peter is saying, wear it as a badge of honor. And if you suffer for it, if you suffer for being a Christian, that's all the more reason to be proud. To be proud to be a Christian. Not be ashamed. So let me ask you, are you proud to be a Christian? Even, even when you're in a context in which maybe you're the only Christian around. Perhaps you know that you would stick out like a sore thumb if the people around you knew that you were a Christian. And, by, and I don't just mean Christian in name only, because there are a lot of people who are Christian in name only. I mean that you actually really believe it and live by it. That's what gets you in trouble, right? If you really, really believe it and live by it. So maybe you feel like you'd stick out like a sore thumb. Maybe the people around you, if they knew that you were a Christian, that maybe they'd clam up and maybe they'd kind of start behaving a little bit differently around you. And that maybe be a little uncomfortable. Maybe they would scoff at you, right? It's, it's actually pretty, pretty mild forms of persecution we might experience here. Who knows what they would think, right? What would they think if they knew that I really believed this or that? Under certain circumstances, anyone is prone to being ashamed of the name of Christ. In fact, Peter himself fell into this trap. This is really insightful to think about. Remember who's writing this this letter, it's Peter, right? And what, what, what's one of the things we know Peter best for? Well, whenever Jesus was arrested, right, Jesus beforehand had predicted, had, had, had foretold that 
Peter would deny him three times for the rooster crowed, and Peter does exactly that. Peter, Peter, the, the rock, you know, Jesus' closest disciple, or at least one of his closest disciples, now he's denied Jesus three times. He was ashamed, right? He, 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 he feared being ostracized. He feared persecution. And so three times Peter denied Jesus. But he was restored. And he later suffered greatly for the faith, even unto death. He did it with great joy. And now he writes this letter in, in retrospect, warning us, hey, do not, do not be ashamed of your faith, but suffer with, with, with great joy. Rejoice in your sufferings. Peter could do this because he believed with all of his being that Jesus is better than all of the comforts of this world. Do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus is better do you love Jesus more than you hate suffering? That's really the, the thrust of his sermon. Um, because because we, we, have to, we have to recognize God's purpose of suffering in our life. And instead of just simply wanting to extinguish it as quickly as possible, we say, God, I, 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 want, I, want, I don't want to waste it. I don't want to waste my suffering. I, I, want, I want you to use it in my life in the greatest possible way. That ought to be our attitude. So we have to understand that the purpose of suffering, and then we respond to it in the ways that we've just discussed. So we need to bring this to a close. And uh, we've, we've come full circle now to verse 17. So remember 17 and 18, we hit those verses in our first point. We haven't addressed verse 19 yet, but what I, what I want to do, I'm just going to read 17 through 19. I'm going to let verse 19 speak for itself, and uh, we will be done. Verse 17, for it is, the, it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Let's pray. God, we, we entrust ourselves to you. God, there are many here this morning who are perhaps going through great suffering. I mean, suffering of, of various kinds. Lord, help them. Help them to see your purpose in it, to trust in you, to respond accordingly. For those of us who maybe have it pretty easy right now, Lord, we, we, we thank you for, for the comforts that we have. They are blessings, but uh, they must be stewarded well. They must not become a, stare, a snare, Lord. So help us to not make an idol of our, of our comfort. Help us to be ready for suffering, for us to embrace the suffering when it comes our way, because we know that you have a purpose. And Lord, we just, we pray, Lord, that, uh, that you will confirm our faith, give us assurance, sanctify us, make us more like Jesus, all for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.